He loves you. Somebody needs to hear that today. Somebody needs to hear Jesus loves you. Amen. Hallelujah. Jesus really loves you. And you know what? I don't care what anybody thinks of me. I don't care if the whole world makes fun of me for loving Jesus. I'm going to tell the whole world that I love Jesus. The Bible says not to, not to love in word and in tongue, but to love in deed and in truth. The Bible says to let love be without hypocrisy. So God wants to have a real relationship with you where you show him you love him. But he has to teach you how to love him. And that's why he's given us his word. Amen. You can be seated if you'd like, brother. If you want. You can stand if you want. But uh, you can have a seat. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, God loves you. Amen. Well, you're welcome to stand. I just ask that you move to the side if you're going to stand. Hallelujah. God's working. Amen. He said God's working. He feels God's love. God's love's real. Let's give the Lord a hand clap. Amen. Hallelujah. If you could just, if you want to stand, yeah, if you want to stand, you can sit on the, on the edge there where you're not blocking anybody. Amen. So yes, God's love is what changed me. God's love. And, and the Bible says this is the love of God that we keep his commandments in 1 John 5, 3. So we have to show God our love. It's not the, this covenant. Whenever there's a covenant, if you know anything about Christianity, you know that we're saved through the blood of the covenant. And in this covenant, you enter in, and a covenant is a, is a spiritual agreement between two people. That's why a marriage is a covenant. So if you've entered into a covenant, that means there's two sides. There's your side, you have a responsibility of the covenant, and God has his responsibility to the covenant. And you better believe God said, I'm going to keep my side. <laughs> He said, if there's ever a sure thing in heaven or on earth, it's going to be that I keep my side of the covenant. But you have a responsibility to keep your side of the covenant and show God that you love him through your obedience. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments in John chapter 14, verse 15. So uh, God this scripture on my heart today we're going to be going over the parables we're going to be going over four parables today but god put this on my heart it's luke 8 10 it says jesus said to unto his disciples unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of god but to others in parables that seeing they might not see and hearing they might not understand so to you who seek out wisdom in the Word of God, God's going to give you understanding. But to all these religious people that say they love Him but don't live it out, He said they're not going to understand the parables. Amen? So God wants you to understand these parables so that they will change your life and that they will affect you for the kingdom. Amen. So God bless you. I'm so glad you're here. This is a, the, called the Parables of Jesus Christ. Let's go to the front page. What is a parable? You might not even know what a parable is. Well, we got the definition right here. It says, usually a usually short, fictitious story that illustrates a moral attitude or religious principle. So sometimes it's a true story, but most of the time it's a fictitious story. That means a fake story that teaches you about a real religious principle. So parables teach you about God's kingdom, in other words. Amen? We're going to do the first parable is Matthew chapter 13, verse 24 through 20. It's called the parable of the wheat and tares. Have you ever heard of that? The parable of the wheat and tares. That's that's the name of this parable. But I'm going to ask God to help me real quick. I'm, I'm going to say a quick prayer. Let's bow our heads. Father God, I pray that you would lead me by your spirit, that you would speak through me today. 
that you would speak to each one according to their need, that you would meet each need. And I pray that you would continue to manifest your wisdom and your love and your severity as well, that we might serve you acceptably by your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is parable of the wheat and tares, verse, starting in verse 24. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat. A tear is a weed. So an enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? For whence then hath it tares? Why is, why is there tares in your field? He said unto them, An enemy has done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? Do you want us to go gather them up? 29. But he said, Nay, lest while you gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, bind them in bundles, and burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Amen. Hallelujah. So this parable is teaching us about the kingdom of heaven. In the kingdom of heaven, there's two types of people. There are people that are called tares, which are weeds. The weeds. But if you know anything about a tear, a this tear looks just like a, a real grain of wheat. If you see a tear and you see a wheat to the naked eye, you won't even be able to tell them apart. So, the Bible says there was a husbandman, that means a landlord, that means a property owner. He went and, and he sowed good seed in his field. He put good seeds down, but all this, all these weeds grew up. And the workers came at the time of harvest and said, did you not put good seeds in the ground? And he said, yes, I did this. But an enemy came in the night and put bad seeds in there. So what you see, an enemy did. And at that time, he said, well, should we go ahead and pull all the weeds out of the field? Because they're weeds, right? You don't want these weeds. Should, should we pull them out? And he said, no. He said, wait to the time of harvest, and then we will separate the wheat from the tares. He said, because if we pull the, all of the tares up right now, we might destroy the good wheat too, and we don't want to destroy the good wheat too. But he said, but at the time of harvest, the weeds or the people that are fake Christians, he said, they they will be bundled up and thrown into the fire, he said. God bless you all. Good to see you. They came for the bus stop. He said, the, the good crop, we're going to put into my barn. But the bad crop, the tares, the, the weeds, they'll be gathered up and thrown into the fire. That was the point of that parable. So let you know that everybody that calls himself a Christian ain't a Christian. We're, we're living in the last days, you all, before Christ comes. They, everybody says, I'm a Christian, but God says, you're either a wheat or a tear. Jesus said, you be able to tell a tree by its fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. So make the tree good, and its fruit will be good. Well, how do you make the tree good? You have to give your whole life to Christ. You have to, you have to make sure that everything in your life is of that good seed of God's Word. Hallelujah. So that was the first parable. The second parable, listen to this, is on the first page. It starts on the first page. It's Matthew 22, 1 through 14. It's the parable of the wedding banquet. The parable of the wedding banquet. Amen. It's getting good now. All right. Follow along with me. 
It's the second paragraph on the first page. The second uh, parable, rather. shit like this, so I don't go away. <laughs> and Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, The kingdom of God is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding. That means those who were invited to the wedding. And they would not come. Hallelujah. Next page. And again, this king sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, which are invited, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it, and they went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth. That means he was very angry. And he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were invited were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together at all as many as they found, both good and bad, and the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guest, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he saith unto him, Friend! How camest thou in hither, in here, not having a wedding? How did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him, hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him in the outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Amen. So this is a parable. There was a great king. And this king was having a wedding for his son. And he goes out and he sends his, his servants, his messengers, out to tell the people about the wedding. He says, come in, I've killed the fattest cow. I've prepared the wedding for you. But what did the people do? They said, oh, I have to take care of my farm. And then the other one said, oh, I have merchandise I have to take care of. They were too busy to come and be with the Lord and to serve Him. Amen? And to come to the wedding, rather. So, what did, and, and then they not only rejected the invitation, then He slew, they slew the messengers that He sent out to tell them. So God, God represents the king. God sent his armies and slew them. He killed them for killing his servants. And then what happened was he called out new servants and he said, You, those people that I invited the first time, they're not worthy to come to my supper for my son, my wedding for my son. So go and get the people in the highways and the byways. That's what we're doing here. The people in the churches, most of them have rejected and have not served the Lord. They, they're Sunday Christians. They just go to church, but they live in sin. And God says, I've rejected them. So now he's telling his servants, go out into the highways. Go out into the, into the hedges and call them. Tell them to come in. And that's what we're doing today. Christ wants you to come in. He doesn't care if you're poor, does he? Christ doesn't care if you're poor. Christ doesn't care if you're a drug addict. I used to be a drug addict. Christ doesn't care if you're an alcoholic or a, a pervert. Christ can change your life. Christ will change your life if you want to be saved. It's a Bible says all those who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So for me, when I was in jail, I started to call on the name of the Lord. I seen that I was in trouble. I seen 
that I was in wicked sin, that I was going to hell. I was a street guy. I used to sell drugs. I used to make my money the wrong way. Get drunk almost every night. That was my life. I started to call on God's name and say, God, change me. I've been a drunk since I've been 12 years old. I need you to change me. And I started to read my Bible. I started to pray. And I got serious with God. And I started to have encounters with God because I kept reading my Bible. I didn't let the devil stop me. I kept reading my Bible. I kept praying. And God brought me all the way out. But I had to be determined that I was going to follow him. And you have to be determined that you're going to follow God because the devil's going to try to stop you. I don't care who you are. If you want to follow Jesus, the devil's going to try to stop you. The devil's going to try to persecute you. He's going to try to make fun of you. Oh, no. Oh, no. Who cares? Our brothers and sisters in Christ are dying in other countries. We just have to get made fun of. Big whoop. Wah, wah, wah. Amen? Let's be tough. You are a soldier in the army of the Lord if you're a real Christian. You got to be a soldier. Jesus called you to be a soldier. You're in the army of the Lord. So, so that's what, uh, so that's what happens. So anyways, to end with this parable, his servants called all those who were not, who the Lord would say are not worthy, the drug addicts, the homeless people, right? The, the mentally out, the, the m mentally ill, right? Some people might think that, oh, God wouldn't want you. But God said, no, go get them. Go invite them. That's who I am, okay? I'm a nobody. Thank you, brother. God bless you. I'm a nobody. I'm somebody that just said yes to Jesus and submitted my life to him. By grace, we're saved. It's his grace. He changed me. And that's what he's got to do. If you want to go to heaven, you got to be changed. You have to ask God to forgive you and change you for your sin. Your sin is made, the Bible teaches that your sin makes us an enemy of God. But Jesus, through his blood, he reconciles us back to God, his Father, through him. So that's the good news, is that we don't have to stay enemies of God in our sin. He's actually reaching out his hand. He's a merciful God. He's a loving God. He's saying, hey, come follow me. Come be my child. I will help you. But what do you have to do? You have to be a disciple. You have to start following. You have to start reading. You have to start asking God to teach you his ways. Amen? So let's go to the third parable. On the second page, it's called the parable of the tablets. This is a, a longer parable. So, pay attention. Parable of the talents. For the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country, who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents. That's like, I don't know, $500. Let's, let's just say, I don't know if it is, but... Let's say it's $500. To another he gave two talents. That's like $200. And to another one, to every man according to his, to his several ability and straightway took his journey. So he took his, he gave them the money and then right after that he took his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the second and made them other five talents. Hallelujah. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gained another two. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of the servants cometh and reckoned with him. Set, settled, that means settled with him. With them. And so he that had received five talents came and, and brought another five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. 
God has been faithful over a few things, I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not straw. And I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast, hast, that is thine. Here, you can have what is yours. He said, His Lord answered and said to him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knowest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore have to put my money to the exchangers. And then at my coming I should receive my own with interest, or usury. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Hallelujah. That's all. So, in this parable of the talents, this, this king, or whoever he was, he was a, somewhat of a wealthy man. He, he gave one talent to one guy. He gave two talents to the next guy. And then the third guy, he gave five talents. And he said, hey, I'm going on a long journey. While I'm gone, you use this to make more money. The first guy who had two talents, he brought back, when the master had come back to settle accounts, he had two more talents. He used what God gave him for the kingdom. The man with the five talents came and he gave five talents back. And he said, look, I've doubled your money. So both servants doubled what God had given them to use for the kingdom, right? Then the third servant came, and he was the one that only had one talent. And the servant came and said, okay, what do you have for me? And he said, well, I knew, I knew you'd be a hard man. That's what they try to say about Jesus. They try to say, oh, he's... When, when you preach against sin and you preach against wickedness, they say, oh, he's a hard man. He's judgmental, right? That's what they, that's what they said. He said, I knew you'd be a hard man where you, where you reap where you don't sow. You know what Jesus said? You wicked servant. Get away from me, you wicked servant. And he cast him into out of darkness. He cast him into where there's gnashing and weeping of teeth. That's a... That's the word of God. So what's the what's the lesson here? Whatever God gives you, you use it for the kingdom. It represents the wisdom of God, the knowledge of God. Whatever God gives you to use, you use it for the kingdom. It, yes, use your money for the kingdom too, but I think there's a deeper meaning even than money. The deeper meaning is anything God gives you, you use it to multiply the kingdom. Whether it's natural or spiritual, you use what God gave you for the kingdom because he's going to come back and he's going to set up accounts with you. That's the point of the parable. We're going to be judged on what we do in this life, how we spend our time. You don't have to be a pastor. You just have to use what God gives you for his kingdom. That's the point. Does everybody get that? Because I want everybody to be fruitful. The Bible says to be fruitful and multiply. The Bible says, if any tree does not bear good fruit, he is cut down and thrown into the fire. If your life doesn't produce good fruit, 
You're not going into the kingdom. Well, I, I, then I hear people say, well, you're trying to earn your salvation. No, I'm not. I'm obeying God's word. You can't earn this. God gives you grace. God gave the talent, didn't he? God gave the talent. Jesus gave the talent to be used. So it was a gift. He couldn't earn it. He gave them the talent. But he expected them to use the talent that was freely given to them. So that's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about trying to earn your salvation. I'm talking about using what God gave you. That's what true Christians do. And the Bible says, be a doer of the word and not a hearer only deceiving yourself. Amen? All right, the next parable. These are good parables, aren't they? They teach us about the kingdom of God. They teach us about what real Christians look like. Matthew chapter 25. This is the, the one on the back. Matthew chapter 25. And then we have Jimmy John's today. So I hope you brought your appetite. Amen? Praise God. Parable of the ten virgins. Matthew 25, 1 through 13. It says, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps, and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps, and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us your oil, for our lamps have gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there not be enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell, and buy it for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Amen. So this parable is about ten virgins. You could say ten Christians, right? They had been, to be a virgin means you're separated from sin. A virgin means you've been made clean, right? A virgin is clean. We got ten virgins. Ten were waiting on Jesus' coming. Ten were waiting for Jesus to show up. But there were five wise and five foolish. The five wise virgins, they were preparing themselves for the return of Christ, for the bridegroom. They were storing up oil so that they could last through the night. They could last through the darkness, which represents the wicked times. And there was five virgins that said, you know what? It's not, we don't need to take this thing that seriously. God will forgive us. Right when we see the judgment coming, we'll say, oh God, forgive me, forgive me. Right? That's what people think, right? But he said, no, he said that door will be shut. He said, those, they will be outside banging on the door. Lord, Lord, open them to us. And Jesus will say, I don't even know who you are. He said, he said, they will be cast out, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Do you understand? These people are going to be screaming. These people were Christians. These people were followers of God. 
but they didn't seek the Lord. They weren't spending their time in their prayer closet. They weren't spending their time in their Bibles. They weren't really in love with Jesus. They were just professing Him with their lips, but their hearts were far from Him. Woe well, unto them. They can never get out. Once you get in hell, you can never get out. There's no teaching about purgatory in the Bible. That's a lie from the pit of hell. If you die in your sin, you will burn there forever because of your rebellion against God. Because of your sin, you'll be damned. So let's not be deceived with this backslidden church. Let's not be deceived by everybody who says they're a Christian. You got to know the Bible for yourself. You got to know these parables for yourself. You have to be on fire for God yourself. Hey Amen. I don't know about you, but the people I hang out with are on fire for God. That helps me stay on fire for God. The devil wants to isolate you. He wants to get you alone so that he can start to plant all these lies in you. Oh, you're you're garbage. You're stupid, right? That's the devil. That's not Jesus. Jesus is trying to help you. Hey, get off the couch. Go hand out some tracks. Go tell somebody, do you really have me? If you really got Jesus, you're going to tell somebody about him. Jesus expects you. He commanded us to go out and to tell people about him. He commanded it. Whether you're in a church or not, whether you have a good pastor or not, you have to follow Jesus. We thank God for good pastors. We thank God for good leaders. And if you have one, you should thank God for them. But if you don't have them, you still got to obey God. You still got to do what God told you to do in his word, which is tell people the truth. Yes, we do it in love, but guess what? People accuse me of not being loving all the time, but I tell them the truth. That is the love. Jesus said, look, look at this verse right here. This is a verse out of the Bible. It says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. That's a Bible verse. So look, sometimes when God's giving instructions through the man of God or through the the word of God, it's not always going to, it's, it's not going to feel good all the time. It's not going to feel good when somebody tells you, you might go to hell. If you, don't, if you don't stop, you'll definitely go to hell. It doesn't feel good. But he said, if you're truly my child, you'll receive the, the correction. If you're a real son of God, if you're a real daughter of God, you will listen when I come to correct you. That's how you know a real child of God from a fake child of God. A real child of God will obey Jesus. And the fake child of God will make an excuse. Well, nobody's perfect. Right? No. The Bible says Jesus is going to judge you in righteousness. you got to be blameless, which means you got to obey God with all the knowledge that you got. That's what God expects you to do. Everything that you know to obey, you're obeying. Everything you know not to obey, you're er, I'm sorry, everything you know not to do, you're not doing. So that's what a child of God does. They don't ignore their conscience. They don't listen to the devil. What happens when you want to go and do what you want to do? Guess what? The devil's there to talk to you. The devil's saying, you know what? You, don't have, you, you gave up the drugs. You don't have to give up the sex outside of marriage. Huh? Let, me, let me tell you what the devil's going to say. Can I, can I speak for the devil real quick? I spoke, I'm speaking for God, but right now I'm speaking for the devil. The devil's going to say this. Hey, you don't have to be all uh, over... You don't have to be religious. It's not religion, it's relationship. Well, that's true. But in, this, in a relationship, do you go and cheat on your wife? No! So, it is a relationship. And if you do only have religion and not a relationship, that's bad. But they use that as an excuse 
to say that you don't have to obey God because it's a relationship and not, that makes no sense. No, because we're in relationship with God, we obey Him. Just like when we are in relationship with our wife or our husband, we don't go and cheat on them. It's the same way. We're in a covenant relationship. And it breaks God's heart when we play the harlot, the Bible says. So we can't cheat on God. We have to be loyal. If we unruffly sin, it should even break our heart. When we come to a knowledge that we're doing something bad that God disapproves of, it should break our heart and we should turn away from that immediately. But you should already be obeying God with all the knowledge that you have. You know it's wicked to smoke. You know it's bad to sleep outside of marriage. Is that what children of God do? No. The children of God, they save themselves for their husband and for their wife. You know what? You know how much it meant to me that, that my wife, like I said, I wasn't always a Christian, but when I got saved, I started praying for a godly wife. And I said, God, I'm going to wait till you bring me the right person instead of picking these bozo losers. Amen? I was picking some losers. <laughs> And I was paying for it. And the guy that was counseling me at the time, he said, you're trying to eat the carp. Don't eat the carp, eat the bass. <laughs> That's what the guy, and he was a man of God, he was telling me the truth. I kept going to the, to the, the gutter and fishing in the gutter, <laughs> you know? No, you need to become a bass and then you need to only eat bass, amen? So what, the, what he told me is you have to become the person that you want to marry. The reason why I was attracting people that were bad is because I was bad. The reason why I was attracting cheaters is because I was having sex before marriage. If they'll do it with you, they'll do it against you. Don't be deceived. A sinner's a sinner. There's no loyalty with thieves. If they'll steal from you, they'll steal from anybody, and vice versa. So, this is what God's teaching us, is we have to be loyal and honest and all in, and we have to do the right thing if we want good people around us. You have to be a good person if you want to attract good people in your life. God wants to give you good people in your life, but guess what? You have to be patient. Number one, they're not just going to fly into your life overnight. Well, praise God if that happens to you. But for me, I was by myself for a long time. Just me and Jesus, which is fine. I would rather be with just me and Jesus and go to heaven. Amen? But it was just me and Jesus, and then I kept praying that God would bring people into my life. But I wasn't sitting at home doing nothing. I was out in the churches. I was out. I went to a Bible study when I was single. I was in a Bible study six nights a week. And most of them were probably not even really right with God, whatever, you know, now that I know the Bible the way that I do. But, listen, God still used it to hook me up with other people that wanted to go all in for God. They were just looking for a leader. So sometimes you have to go out there and you have to be the leader. Be a leader, not a follower. You be the person that says, hey, why don't we quit being hypocrites and why don't we really live for God? You be the person that everybody either loves or hates. Because if you're a real Christian, they'll either love you or they'll hate you. A lot of times they smile to your face, but when you walk away, they're stabbing you in the back. They're called, what are they called? Backstabbers. <laughs> but that's okay, we have to love our enemies. We have to pray for those who revile us and persecute us. But I'm here to say, God has a future for your life. Listen to me. God has a future for your life. They counted me out. When I was in jail, I was facing a felony. They had diagnosed me with um, all kinds of stuff. Post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, you name it, they put it on me. When I was 17, they diagnosed me as a suicidal alcoholic. I was a war veteran. They, they counted me out. They said, this guy, he's past 
fix him. He screwed up, and I was. I was screwed up. It was impossible. I tried. I, as an adult, I think I went to seven or eight rehabs as an adult. I was constantly at the VA trying to get help for my head. And I went to AA nonstop. For 10 years I went to AA. I read the blue book. I was a good AA person, but it could not keep me sober. God refused to let it keep me sober because he wanted all of me. I praise God for that. <laughs> He didn't want to just get rid of the alcohol. God don't just want to get rid of your drugs and alcohol. God wants to change you from the inside out. God wants you to clean up. He wants you to be a clean child of God. He wants you to quit smoking, drinking, cussing, acting like a child of the devil. He wants you to change you into a new creature. That's the good news of Jesus. You'll have new desires. I want to obey God. I want to please my Father. I'm in a real relationship with God. I'm going somewhere, guys. I'm somebody. I wasn't nobody in my sin. I was, a, I was on a dead-end path that leads to hell. If you're in sin, you're... Listen, guys, you're on a dead-end path. You're, your time is limited. You've received your reward in full. If you, this is not all there is. <laughs> There's a future after this life, either in heaven or in hell. So why don't you get a real future with God? Cling to the Lord and hate what is evil, the Bible says. Cleave unto the Lord. That means like a, like a man cleaves unto his wife. That means they become one. That means they, they work out their salvation together. God doesn't want you to try to clean yourself up. You tried that for many years. You tried to do it yourself. You tried. What happened? You kept ending up in dead in relationships. You kept ending up on drugs. God loves you. He wants to give you a new path, a new way. The Bible says his ways are above our ways and his thoughts are above his thoughts. His thoughts are above our thoughts. So what stops you? You! You stop you. I'm not saying it's easy to follow Jesus. I had to withdraw from, from pills. I was hooked on oxy-30s. You know what 30s are? Blues? You know what those are? I was hooked on those. I, I used to do 25 to 50 a day. I used to sell them. I used to have people go to the doctor for me. I, I lived in Florida. I would drive up here and sell them to poor souls. God have mercy. How did I get out? I fought. I fought for my life. The devil was trying to kill me. And I had to fight for myself, but I didn't fight by myself. I fought by getting my head in this book and fighting by saying, God, I know you can do it. And God was saying, come after me, son. Follow me, son. You're mine now. You're not the devil's. And when, and when I would sin, he would chasing me. He would, he would let me know, this will lead you to hell. Son, I love you, and that's why I'm telling you this. And that's what you have to be determined to do. Because God doesn't want 95% of you. God wants everything you have. He wants your whole heart. Just like how you want your husband to love you and you want to love your husband with all your heart. That's how God says, I don't want 99% of you. I don't want you to be loyal to me 99 out of 100 days and then on the 100th day you go and sleep with somebody else. That's what it's like when you go and you disobey God and you cheat on God with sin. God's saying, I don't want that type of relationship. I made a way for you. If you would come and, and work with me, I'll help you come out of all your sins. I'll help you to hate your sin. You will hate having sex outside of marriage when I get done with you. Amen? It makes you feel sick anyways. I remember how sick I was having sex with people that I wasn't married to. 
I didn't trust them, and why should I? They're adulterers, and so am I, if I'm doing that outside of marriage. So why would you trust these people? They don't love you, otherwise they would do it the right way. True love, the Bible says love does not rejoice in iniquity. It rejoices in the truth. Love obeys God. Love says, you know what, I want, my body wants to have sex with you, but I'm not going to because I know it will hurt you. It will hurt you. It will hurt your spirit. It will damage your soul. Am I, am I telling the truth? Somebody needs this today. God's speaking. God values you. He values your body. The Bible says the body is not for fornication, but it's for the Lord. God made you to be a vessel for Him. He, he wants you to be an honorable man of God or a woman of God. He wants you to be a loyal, somebody who you can be proud of. He wants to give you your dignity back. And this is what the holy remnant is. You are the holy remnant. Maybe nobody is speaking this over you in your life, but let, let the Lord speak over you. You are God's child. You matter to God. Let me speak for God. God loves you. You are not like them. You are different. You are mine. I chose you to be my child. Don't go with them. Don't be used like that. My children are better than that. My, my children are valued because I value them. So God wants to put you around people that value you. I value you, brothers and sisters. That's why I take every thought captive when my flesh wants to lust. I say no, because I love with a fierce love, with a lion love. God is the lion of Judah. Jesus is the lion of Judah. He's a fierce lover. He ain't playing any games. He said, I wish you were either hot or cold. He said, but because you're lukewarm, I'll speed you out of my mouth. Don't be halfway. In all things that you do, do them with all of your heart. If you want to be wicked, go be wicked with all of your heart. But if you want to be mine, be mine with all of your heart. That's what God wants. He wants you to be, He wants you to experience the fullness of Christ in this life. But you have to do that through faith. You have to believe like nobody else believes around you. Because this type of faith, you have to be stubborn to believe it. And God will bring it to pass. But this world, the people around you, they don't believe. Most of them. Unless you're in a really good church, amen? Most people don't believe like how God wants you to believe. Jesus told his disciples, ye of little faith, and God has told me that before. Jesus has told me that before. Because I say I believe Him, but then I put limitations on Him. No, if you need healing for your body, I'm going to believe God for you. Because by His stripes you are healed. And He confirms the Word of God with signs and miracles. I see that. We live it, don't we, Brother John? We see people healed. He was not able to even walk hardly a couple weeks ago. Look at Him. That was God. Whether you admit it or not, it was God. Do we have to see it like this in order to believe it was God? No. We know it's God. God's the one giving us the activity of our limbs. God's allowing me to do this right now. He's given us freedom and, and free choice for you to choose your destiny. You choose heaven or you choose hell. You choose this day whom you will serve. If you choose to go back to your old ways, you're choosing hell. I beg you, there's a much better way. I, God treats me like a king, even though I'm a servant. I'm God's servant, but God treats me so good. 
but I don't need to be treated like that. I would serve him even if, Job said, even if the Lord slay me, I will still trust in him. Look, God will bless you in your life, but that's not why you serve him. Once, he, once you follow him and obey him and he blesses you, don't forget about him. A lot of people, God blesses, and, and the, the houses come, the money comes, they get a couple vehicles in the driveway, and what happens? They forget about it. That's stupid. Yes. That's very stupid because all this stuff, all the, all this stuff's going to burn up. When Jesus comes back, he read the Bible, 2 Peter chapter 3, everything's going to be burned up. Don't get caught up in this physical stuff. Don't get caught up with money. Don't sell your soul for a dollar. If you're poor, be poor, but be faithful. And God will bring increase as he sees fit. As he sees fit. Guess what? If you're poor in this country, you're still way more richer than all the other countries around you. Don't be covetous. Jesus said, beware of covetousness. For a man's life does not consist in the things he possesses. Your life, you're not going to be happy because you get a house and two cars. Ask America. America has that. They're wicked. They're miserable. They're going down quick. Ask somebody who found true life. I got peace. I can sleep at night. Whether I'm in a little house, I don't care. I'll sleep in a tent if I got to, just to make sure I'm going with Jesus when he comes. And that's got to be your heart. You can't get caught up with this physical stuff. Oh, I got to work. I got to work overtime. You got enough. You don't need to work overtime. Now, I'm not saying you can't work overtime, but I'm saying, look, a lot of people work overtime and they're not doing the work of the Lord. If you did the work of the Lord, God would give you favor and make sure that you could pay those bills. So I'm not against overtime. I'm just saying when you spend your whole life on overtime and you're not willing to serve the Lord, there's a problem there. Because when you serve the Lord, God will make all grace abound towards you. And that's what I'm talking about. I am blessed by the Lord, but that's not why I serve Him. I don't serve him for the fishes and the loaves. I serve him because I love him. And he knows that. And he tested me when I had nothing. He tested me when I had very little. I didn't want to let go of that drug money. I was selling Suboxone after I got off the, the hard stuff. I, I, was, uh, I was used to selling drugs. So I, now I was selling with the, what I got for my addiction, which was Suboxone. I didn't need 16 milligrams a day. So I sold what I didn't need for, for good money. But God tested me and said, are you gonna trust in this drug money? Or are you gonna trust that I can provide for you the right way? And I said, as hard as it was, I let go of that money. That money had a hold on me. And you know what I did? I let go of that money and I started paying tithes to a church. And God released me of that fear of not having enough. And he made sure, even there were times in the beginning of my marriage that we didn't have enough money to go to the store. And guess what? There was a, a check that showed up in my mailbox for $250 from the insurance company. Don't ask me why. I don't even know why to this day. But I'm telling you, it's because I was all in for Christ. I showed him through my money that I'm trusting in him. I showed him through my life, through my relationships. I cut off people that I loved because they weren't serving God. I said, look, I can't, I can't be close to you anymore because you're not serving Jesus. I'm following Jesus now. I can't talk about women in rude ways anymore. I can't listen to this music anymore. This is not pleasing to God. I'm the vessel of God. I'm the temple of the Holy Ghost. That's what a Christian is. The holy presence of God dwells in me. I can't defi get defiled. 
The Ark of the Covenant represents the presence of God. The same presence dwells in us. So you should fear God, okay? Because He doesn't, He doesn't give the Spirit to those who don't obey Him. He gives the Spirit to those who obey Him. Acts 5.32 Be loyal to God. Have the true love of God that comes through obedience and faithfulness. Read your Bible every day. Pray. Get around people that truly love you and that's not just trying to use you. And don't waste your time with users. Amen. Cut them off. Right. Amen. Can we get a word of hand clap? <laughs> Amen. So God bless you all. I'm going to do an altar call. If you want prayer, if you, if you want to rededicate your life to Christ and say, God, I'm going to lay these things down, whatever the Holy Spirit is bringing your mind to, I'm going to lay these things down. Today's the day. You might be dead tonight. You don't know. You don't know how long you're going to live, do you? But the Bible says your days are numbered. God knows how long you're going to live. So... Don't chance it. Don't gamble with your eternity. Choose Christ. Choose to follow Him. Make the sacrifice that you need to. Even though it's hard. you got to be the voice of reason in your own life. You have to parent yourself. You have to let God parent you. Amen? You have to listen to the voice of the Lord when He's calling you. So, I know that Word of God is like a, it's like a sword. He says, isn't, isn't my word like a fire? His word's like a fire. It, it, it comes to burn everything out of your life that's not like Jesus. So, the question is, God is here to influence you to come to Him, but He's not going to force you. He doesn't force anybody to come to Him. He simply influences you by convicting you of sin. But you have to choose. Who, who you're going to serve in your life. Religious people go to hell every day. you got to truly know God and obey Him in all things. So if you heard the voice of the Lord, if, if you are ready to follow, to serve, to obey God, come now. You don't know when you're going to die. Serve the Lord the rest of your days and be blessed. Amen? Amen? Does anybody want prayer? Want prayer? Amen? Come on up, brother. We're going to pray for you. What's your name, sir? Dylan. Dylan. God bless you, Dylan. We're glad you're here.
Jesus is setting people free. Does anybody else want a cleansing from Jesus? He loves you. He's here to set the captives free. So we're going to go ahead and pray for this food if nobody else wants prayer. If anybody wants prayer after the service, then uh, speak to me or any of these brothers that came up to, to pray. And we're going to go ahead and pray. So, Father God, we thank you so much that you love us and that you're just waiting for us to make up our mind. And I pray for this food that you would, we thank you for being our provider. You're so good to us. Thank you for loving us and, and blessing us, putting us in a country where there's so much food available. We pray that you would use this food to strengthen our bodies, that you would help us. Help us, Lord God. And uh, we pray that you empower us through this food and through your grace to serve you acceptably. We love you with all of our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a hand clap. Let's go ahead and line up.